This is Danielle DiMartino Booth with Valuetainment Economics. I'm bringing you today an audience with Jeffrey Gunlack, founder of DoubleLine. We're here in Los Angeles and we hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome. Have, have you seen Between Two Ferns? Okay. I have seen it. I saw Barack Obama on it, I think. <laughs> Funny movie. That's with that Zach guy, right? Yeah, just reminded me of that. But let's, let, let, let's start off with something serious. Where were you when Scott Norwood missed the field goal in 1991? Let's see, I was in my fa family room in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. in my first house. I thought he was going to miss it, but... Uh, Eight seconds to go. Yeah, it, but, it, but in those days, I think it was 47 yards, I think it was 45, but in those days, it wasn't so automatic. These days, a 45-yarder, they make it all the time. The yep. kickers have gotten so much better. You wonder why kickers are so much better because uh, you would think that there's no like new technology or anything involved. It's a leg. Yeah. And there was, m maybe they're better at strengthening the legs somehow through advanced science. That, that was my way of saying you were born and raised in Buffalo. That's right. Yeah. And I, I had never been to a Bills game when that happened. I had never been to one. I, we, we, f we couldn't afford stuff like that when I was a kid. And then I moved out of Buffalo. And the first uh, football game, professional football game that I went to, was actually the Bills getting killed by the, the Cowboys in Pasadena because uh -huh. that was right in town. And we were actually ahead in that game for about a minute and a half. And then Jim Kelly was knocked out and <laughs> I knew it was over. Full disclaimer, grew up an Oilers fan, San Antonio. Well, um, then that Bills comeback had to be painful. So I've done a little bit of, of research, uh, some, some interviews you've done in the past. And um, I, I also grew up poor and I also had a broken dryer when I was a kid. In, ah, in yeah. my case, it, it meant going to the laundromat yeah, to dry hung, the clothes. We, my mom had to hang the stuff in the basement in the winter, and she would hang it on the line uh, outside the house in the summer. In the summer. And that's actually pretty pleasant because you get this kind of fresh air kind of deal going. But you know, we, when you're a kid, you make lemonade out of lemons. So we had, uh, down in the basement, we had a, we built a maze out of throws that we had to buy to cover the couch because the couch wore out uh -huh. and we didn't have enough money to buy a couch because yep. look if you can't buy a dryer you can't buy a couch so what you do is you buy a cloth and you throw it on top of the couch so it doesn't look so shabby and then that wears out and so we stored them up and we made mazes in the basement to play tag in in the winter time because in buffalo in the winter you know, there's not a lot to do other than, you know, snowball fight. We, we built a hockey rink in our backyard by just shoveling the snow. And when you shovel the snow, because there's so much snow in Buffalo, you get boards, essentially, which yeah. is the old snow. And your Zamboni machine is a hose, a <laughs> garden hose. And you just, and, and it, it actually works pretty well. Yep. And so that was, that was pretty good. But the, there was actually a bowling craze. A lot of people, you know, there's been manias over and over in financial markets. And when I was a kid, there was actually a bowling mania, if you can believe it. Bowling stocks were the hot area. Publicly traded companies. Yeah, AMC, I think, made bowling balls yep. or bowling shoes or something. Still do, but yeah. And uh, bowl weirdly, bowling was, was super popular briefly. Kind of like tennis was, I think, like in the 70s and 80s, and it's kind of fallen off Mac somewhere. Macken Rome. Yeah. What was your first job as a kid? I was a substitute newspaper deliverer. Substitute? Yeah, it was, it was like there was a kid in the neighborhood, and my brother actually was that kid for a while, that it would have a paper route, you know, and you would oh, deliver yeah. door to door. And, but th those, the, whoever the guy was, the kid that had the paper route, they'd go on vacation. You know, their family would go on vacation, somebody had to fill in. Right. And uh, so that was my very first job. Uh, I, I mowed lawns, I don't know if that counts. I can't, that probably was a second job. Got like $3 for mowing a lawn. $3. Yeah. I shoveled snow for the neighbor across the way. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what he paid me. I don't think it was $3. <laughs> but he like, it, it, but that, you know, it, I, it was just to get walking around money. Did you like school when you were young? No, I didn't like it at all. I was bored out of my mind. I, uh, I would just stare at the clock. And I would do a thing like prisoners do, I think, at least in the comic books or on TV and the movies, where they do the days, you know, on the, on the side of the cell. You've seen that kind of depiction, oh, yeah. right? Well, I, I would do that watching the clock, how many minutes to go in the class. It was like, so obviously I was metaphorically feeling like I was a prisoner. 
because it was so incredibly dull. But you probably got great grades. Sure, I got straight A's. SATs? Sure, I was vir virtually perfect. I was heard a perfect score on my GRE for math mm -hmm. for, for graduate school. Did you pick Dartmouth or did Dartmouth pick you? Um, I went to my guidance counselor uh, in high school and my brother had gone to Princeton, mm -hmm. which was very controversial in my family. They, didn't, they were very class conscious and my grandparents thought that that wasn't our place, if you will. And uh -huh. my brother finagled his way to claim that he wanted to go into architecture. And Princeton was reputed to be great in architecture. Right. And my parents wanted to go to University of Buffalo, which is where my, my father and my uncles went, because it was cheap. Yeah. And my brother didn't want to go there. And so he finagled this, this scheme. I, I, don't, I think it was largely fabricated that since University of Buffalo didn't have a great architecture department, he couldn't go there. I don't think he took a single <laughs> architecture class <laughs> at Princeton. But I went to my guidance counselor and I said, you know, um, he, he goes, where do you want to go to college? I, I said, I don't know, I want to study like math. And he, he says, well, you know, Colgate's good and Dartmouth is good and Yale is good. And, University of Buffalo is actually good at math. So I applied to those four schools. And I didn't visit any of them um, before I applied. I just applied to four schools and I got in and I visited them and I, uh, I really liked Dartmouth, uh, just the feel of the place when I got there. And so, so I decided to go there. Anybody who knows you would, would understand the math aspect. Yeah. What was up with philosophy? Well, after uh, the first term at Dartmouth, I came back to Buffalo for the winter break. And I went over, uh, hung out with two of my best friends from high school. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting in the kitchen and they were talking about they had taken philosophy 101. And they had coincidentally, one went to, one went to uh, 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 Stanford and the other one, I think he went to Princeton actually, ironically. And they talked about how they liked... What was in the water in your town? Yeah, they I liked mean, there's philosophy. a lot of smart kids. They liked philo Yeah, they, actually, my high school spoke about that for ye years, if not decades afterward. My class was, like, remarkably, uh, I don't know, maybe it was something in the water, like you say, uh, yeah. or maybe, maybe, it was, maybe it was the fluoride or something. But they talked about how they really liked philosophy, and they went through some of the basic things that you do in philosophy 101, like, mm -hmm. you know, choice versus fate and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, that sounds pretty interesting. So I started taking it. Well, it's not boring. And I just took one after another. And before I knew it, I had enough for a major in both math and philosophy individually. It was, it's just one of those things. Like Doug Flutie said when he played for the Bills, I remember him saying, I'm not trying to, all I'm trying to do is get a first down. I'm just trying to get a first down. And eventually, you, you just run out of field. And if you keep getting first downs. Just keep, just keep getting you, first downs. You, yeah, you end, up, you end up getting the touchdown. And that was kind of how I ended up in math and philosophy. I, was, I, I liked it, and I kept taking it. Next thing I knew, I had a dual major. What was, um, what was the most pragmatic thing you learned in any, any of your studies? <laughs> very, I mean, I mean very we're, we're little, talking about very little applicability to the real world. I, when I studied in graduate school at Yale for uh, theoretical mathematics, the only thing that we talked about that had any practical application is we were doing a combinatorics thing that, that related to the Rubik's Cube in kind of a metaphorical way. That was it. But the, the way it works is the more you study biology, the more it turns into chemistry. The more you study chemistry, the more it turns into physics. The more you, turn, you study physics, the more it turns into math. And the more you study math, it turns into philosophy. Well, I mean, if you think back to the ancient Greeks, that's kind of true, isn't it? I think it's really literally true even to this day. Mm -hmm. that's, kind of, that's kind of the sequence of it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of there's actually philosophy involved in math. A lot of people don't understand that because they think of math as arithmetic or calculus. But the whole idea of meta layers of infinities mm -hmm. is really philosophical. And it's interesting because a lot of this meta, meta infinity stuff has absolutely no practical application at all. And it never will because infinity doesn't exist. Right. That is deep. So it's a weird study of, a, of an intellectual precept that actually is completely flawed. And this is, this is what I was studying when I was studying mathematics at Yale in graduate school. I wanted to debunk Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which is one of the great theorems people say of the 20th century. And it basically is, revolves around layers of infinity 
and uh, it, since the fee doesn't exist, the theorem is actually not valid. And I couldn't get, I got bait and switched. I had an advisor that encouraged me to do this, and then at the last minute they said, you can't do that here. We study Lee algebras. We're, you're, as a graduate student, your thesis is basically a chapter in our next Lee algebra textbook. And I just said, I'm not doing this, and I left. So this is a little off script, but is there corruption in academia? Um, there's politics in academia, mm -hmm. which I was so naive. I really thought that it was like intellectual purity, and you go and you become a professor, and everything's just incredibly stimulating intellectually, and nobody has an agenda. I think I was at Yale for about a day when that, that myth got exploded, and I realized that it's just another it's just another group of people that have all of the dynamics that groups of people have. And the fact that they're college professors doesn't really change that dynamic at all. Well, I have to ask, my, my dad was raised in East Haven. He actually went off to, uh, he went off to Yukon, and then, he, and then Vietnam came. But, um, but he grew up in East Haven. Did you ever make it to Pepe's Pizza? I don't think so. I don't think I made it to East Haven. Uh, no, no, Pepe's Pizza is in New Haven. We would go into New Haven yeah, to go I, to Pepe's Pizza. I didn't spend a lot of time in New Haven. I, I lived out in the country. Really? About, yeah, about 25 miles away from New Haven, because New Haven, I couldn't get an apartment. It was just the bottom line. I, I, couldn't, I, didn't get, I couldn't get a student housing, because huh. it was very limited for graduate students. Right. And mm -hmm. so I was forced to find an apartment, and there, there basically weren't any. Right. Maybe I started looking too late, too close to the school year, and so I just, you know, they have those bulletin boards where people hang up a piece of paper with a tear out oh, yeah. type of deal. And one was for this house in Cheshire, Connecticut. And oh, Cheshire's beautiful. <laughs> I drove up there and I said, this is very inconvenient locationally relative to school, but it sure is beautiful. But and you, knew how to, you knew what to do with a snow tire, so. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a big, it was a beautiful place. I mean, it was just, it turned out that the father of this woman who was attending Yale Law School uh, owned the house and had just renovated it and it basically had three suites in it kind of and I shared it with these two other uh, Yale students huh. and it made it made life kind of easy because there's really nothing to do but study because I'm yeah. out there in the country I didn't have a TV or I didn't watch it I think one of the, one of the women there had a TV and I had to study about 100 hours a week so, so there the weren't curriculum. exactly weekends hopping into New York City? No, I, I, I think I went to New York City once, um, but I just studied all the time and, and I, I got burned out on it and I realized that I really, there were only two places to go with a PhD in mathematics and that's into the spy business, NSA, uh -huh. you know, or be a professor. That's kind of it. And I'm trying to picture as a professor, it's not happening. Neither, well, I, I was delusional and I thought that I would be a professor. I was, I, I was actually going to be a philosophy professor, but that, that got even more remote. And so uh, I just decided one, I, I almost never have a problem sleeping. But people, one of the questions you get a lot from potential investors, what keeps you what up at night? What keeps you up at night? You know, and yeah. I said, I'm not going there. I, nothing keeps me up at night. Um, but there was one night at Yale where I couldn't just, I was up all night. I just couldn't because I was like, I can't do this anymore. I have to be a drummer? I, I just, I didn't know what, I was, I was like, my head was kind of spinning. I was trying to figure out, well, I'm not going to do this math thing, so what am I going to do? And I was like, so maybe I'll go to business school. I thought about that. You know, I'm like, no more school. I don't want to go to school anymore. And so you were, I just decided. You were clearly musically inclined. Well, I, had been, I was playing in, in bands, and I played in band while I was at Yale. That was the one thing I did other than study. And the lead guitar player was all hell-bent on coming to Los Angeles because there was a red-hot music scene in Los Angeles in the early 80s. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there were a lot of clubs. There was a lot going on. And so I didn't have anything better to do. So I said, let's try that. And I got my junky Chevy Monza with, you know, with the, the uh, uh, stainless steel, is it? Or is it aluminum? Aluminum engine block, I think it was. <laughs> and and uh, just drove across the country, non, you know, five, six, seven days, or whatever it was. Wow. And uh, all day driving. And I ended up crashing on the apartment of our lead guitar player. And we started playing in bands. We made some records and stuff. 
we were we were okay. I th we thought we were better than we really were, I think. Um, and we played in clubs a lot and made very little money doing it. Mm -hmm. So I had to get a, a real job. And I got a job working for an insurance company because they love math people yep. at insurance companies oh, sure. for actuarial stuff. For actuarials, yep. And I, what shocked me is I didn't hate it. <laughs> really? I, I dreaded going in the first day and it was amazing. After a few days I was like, you know, I think this this isn't that bad. This uh, this is this business world thing isn't that bad, and so I uh, was working there. And I this is story's been reported many times, and it's absolutely true. I, I was living in Hollywood. I still had the band thing going, and all my furniture was was lent to me, if you will, or donated to me by people I knew. Uh huh. So I had a cardboard box for a TV stand. Um, I had, you know, chairs that were given to me, a table that was probably this big that was for, to eat off of and so on. And I was thinking about, um, you know, actually then I started thinking about getting an MBA. And I even took, I even took the GMAT, I think. Is it called GMAT? The, the it was the GMAT. The, yeah, GMAT. Yeah, I once took the GMAT, the LSAT, and the GRE in, yeah. in a two-week window. Don't ever do that. Yeah. Uh, and I, I wouldn't do that, no. <laughs> it was not good. It, it was, it's exhausting to take those tests. They, they go all day. I ended up with the MBA route, obviously. But anyways. Yeah. And so I was getting second thoughts about, I didn't, I didn't want to fill out the applications. for I, I just wouldn't, I'd leave them in the corner. I wouldn't get to them. And I was saying, this is, this is telling you something. You're avoiding this. You don't want to do this. And I flipped on the TV. I had uh, three stations, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Uh, no cable or anything. I had a, actually a wire coat hanger for an antenna because it was an old black and white <laughs> oh, yeah, TV. Yeah. And, and, and the dial had broken off. So I needed pliers to change the stations. Actually, I know what you're talking about. I've, yeah. I, we had it a TV like, this, like that when I was growing it, up. It was like yep. this big. And so I flip it on. And I think it was on ABC, there was a show that I'd never really watched. It was called Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous. The rich, yep. Robin Leach, Champagne Wishes and Caviar Dreams. And he says, we have a special show. It's got that funny Australian English accent, whatever it is today. We're going to count down the top paying professions. And I'm like, cool. You know, this will be, <laughs> let's, let's figure it out. Make my list. So amazingly, Actuary was on the list. And they kept counting down. And number one was investment banker. And they say, you have to work very hard and be very analytic, but it's the best paying profession. I'm like, I work hard all the time, and I'm extremely analytic. analytical. So I immediately went to the closet where I kept the Los Angeles yellow pages. The, it was white and yellow. It was the phone book. Yep. You, know, don't, you don't see those much anymore. And I went to the yellow pages with the intention of applying to investment banking firms. Uh -huh. but, um, I was so naive, I, didn't, I expected that investment banker would be in the yellow pages. But it, but it wasn't. There is no investment banker heading. But there was investment management. And I couldn't be bothered with the details. I said, that's close enough. <laughs> and so I, I, I wrote a very aggressive cover letter and, uh, and had my resume. And I sent it to everyone that had a bold face ad in the Los Angeles Yellow Pages. There were about 20, 20 of them. And I was, went to my job at the, at the insurance company, and I was using their uh, equipment to print off my <laughs> resume. And this girl I was friendly with comes up to me and says, what are you doing? And I said, I'm printing off my resumes. I'm going to be an investment banker. And she looks at my list that I'm sending it to, and she says, none of these are investment, investment banking banks. firms. <laughs> and I was like, I, OK. And uh, she said, well, I'll tell you what, if you're applying to these types of firms, I used to work down the street at this one. And you can send it to this guy who's like an important guy there, so you get like an in, and his name's Glenn Wyrick. So I added them to the list. Turned out that I only got three rep replies from the, all the ones that I sent. Uh, one of them was like the college rejection letter, where it's like a sentence, you know, and another one was, hey, we're a two-man shop, you have a fascinating background, but we can't pay you anything. <laughs> uh -huh. And I said, well, that's going to be a problem because I'm, yeah, I, right. I, right, so. Lifestyles but, of the rich so, so and famous. It, it turned out that I ended up getting one from the firm that this woman had told me to give me the in. And it looked like the college rejection letter, too. 
And I was so disgusted, I just, I didn't even read it, and I threw it in the trash. And then later that evening, I, uh, the curiosity got the better of me, and I went and fished it out of the trash, and it said, we have had a large, a large response to our job posting, but you can give us a call. I mean, you know, don't get your hopes up, but give us a call. I was like, job posting? So some weird serendipity had happened that I had Because you had no idea something. that there was a job posting. Right, I didn't know anything about it. I, I was just sending it to this, to this referral, if you will. And I ended up getting an interview. And I don't, they didn't know what to make of me because they, they were, they, they, I, I had no background whatsoever in anything even related. I had read one book. It was called Inside Wall Street. And it <laughs> explained what a stock and, and a convertible bond. It was very, very breezy and high level type Not of stuff. exactly liar's poker. So I ended up getting invited back uh, for an interview, ironically, with Glenn Weirich, because he wasn't even the one that had sent me the thing. It was a very strange uh, chain of events. And so I sit there and he goes, you know, we could really use a quant like you, but uh, I'm not sure how we would use you. Um, you know, uh, what do you think you'd be, be uh, more suited to, uh, equities or fixed income? And I looked right at him. And I said, I don't know what those things are. And his jaw almost hit the floor. And he said, equities, they're stocks. Oh, and fixed income, that's bonds. And I didn't tell him, but I was thinking, what are bonds? I don't know what those are. <laughs> so I, but I knew what stocks were. And I'd actually been attracted to the stock market when I was about 10 years old, mm -hmm. maybe 12 years old because there was a roaring bull market into the early 70s. Right. And there was a, a thing then that was a very increasingly narrow market like we have now yeah. that was called the Nifty 50. The Nifty 50. And one of the Nifty 50 was Xerox. And we owned, my father owned Xerox because his brother invented the commercial Xerox copier and was the head of research at Xerox. Oh my gosh. And so he had given him, he said, look. Upper New York. We're gonna, we're gonna be going somewhere company. with this, this this, he, he actually made it commercially viable. He's, he had 150 patents plus, uh, my father's brother. And so we had bought Xerox and had participated in this incredible Run up. increase. And we were, we, were not, we, were, we were lower middle class. And for the first time ever, we actually felt like we had a little bit of money because this Xerox stock had done so well. And my mother was begging my father to sell it. Oh. They never did. Oh. And then the bear market came. And at that time, I was in eighth grade, and there was a small week-long thing about the stock market as part of social studies. And as kind of an a assignment, if you will, everyone was supposed to pick a stock and you know, chart it or follow it day sure. by day. And so I picked Xerox. And it was, I remember it was like at 153. And every day, it dropped like two, three points oh, every gosh. day. It was a brutal bear market from 72 into 74. Oh, yeah. And it, it just kept dropping, it went below 100, it went down to 50, it went down. And boy, was my mother upset about that because she, she didn't believe in that whole stock market thing, really, and wanted to cash out at the top. So uh, that's how I learned a little about the stock market. But ever since that Xerox assignment, I was following the stock market, mm -hmm. and my father had bought me shares in Pratt & Lambert because he worked at a yep. chemical company that was purchased by Pratt & Lambert. Yep. And he had bought me a few shares, and so I was following that. So when the newspaper would come, I would every single day go and check on my Pratt & Lambert stock. And I was at my grandfather's house when the paper came one day, and I went, I looked at it, and it was on the American Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. Pratt & Lambert was. Gosh. And my, and, and my, uh, my grandfather, who had been a stockbroker in the 20s, in, oh my gosh. In, in fact, he, he, he stayed in the stock market even though he was bearish going to the crash because he felt conflicted. How could he keep his clients in the market if he was getting out of the market? And so he ended up, he, he ended up still being relatively wealthy for uh, that time. But he says to me, why are you looking at the American? All that matters is the New York Stock Exchange. It's the New York Exchange. Stock Exchange. I remember him saying that Gosh. to me. And so, you know, he had been in, in that sort of thing. But I followed it ever since then. And um, anyway, I mean, that's how I ended up. I got a job finally in the bond department 
because mm -hmm. they needed a quant supposedly in the bond department. Well, I think I think and quants maybe a little bit more important in fixed income. Yeah, yeah. And I was uh, they were so skeptical of my background that I was hired for thirty thousand dollars a year on a probationary period. I think it was sixty days. It may have been ninety days, and I spent uh, a couple of weeks in between before I started, and I had two weeks off, and I read all the fixed income stuff. And one was called Inside the Yield Book, which is kind of the, 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 the Bible of fixed income uh, mathematics and stuff, and it had two sections. There was a text, and then the second half of the book was all these formulas. And since I was fresh off of a PhD math program, I figured this is a good opportunity. I derived all the formulas from scratch oh, myself. Gosh. So, and I figured everybody did this. Uh, so I walked here's in. The, so, here's so, the black shoals. So, here's how the black shoals so, so work. So I walked in my first day on the job thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going to be so overwhelmed by all of the depth of knowledge and all the stuff. And in, in, a, in a few days, I realized I know more about this than anybody here. Oh, gosh. <laughs> because it turned out that the guy that was run, the bond department was a necessary evil. They were really were a stock firm, stock mm -hmm. manager, but so in those days, a lot of pension plans had what they called balanced accounts. Of course. And they gave it to one manager, both the stocks and the bonds. And they were all, were all focused on the stocks, so somebody had to take care of this bond thing. And they hired an old crony of one of the stock guys, and he was completely worthless as an investment manager. He was awful. I, I mean, he, he always acted exclusively on emotion. Clients would actually occasionally go over their statements and say, how can it be that you bought this bond at this price and there, it never traded at that price? It's because he <laughs> actually bought at the top tick and it never even registered in like the, the, the Tellerate database or whatever yep. it was back in those days. Gosh. And I thought I was doomed because I'm like, I'm trapped in this department which is so incompetently managed it took me a couple of years to realize that was actually a blessing because it provided opportunity. Well, sure. Because I couldn't learn anything from this guy except what not to do. But it meant that there was a lot of opportunity if you actually could provide some value. Let's bring the godfather into this. Closing business. You, f you feel like Michael Corleone in the, god in the Godfather when you would close business. I read one of, no, this that's is an not, old. That, that, that's not true. No? That, no. That, what, what happened is there was a, uh, a line that I think I misremembered slightly in the movie The Godfather, which right. I had never, which I'd never seen. I, I had actually just seen a clip of it. I don't think I've ever watched that movie all the way through. Um, and there was a thing where I think there was a wedding that's going on, and these people all come in and ask the guy, the Marlon Brando of character, course. for favors. Mm -hmm. And there's one guy that's asking for a favor, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm misremembering, but he says something like, "You come in here, you ask for favors." and you don't even call me godfather. So what I, I, I purloined that concept whenever we would have a trade idea or something and there'd be a disagreement if we were, back when I was not fully in charge of things. Sure. And we'd be like, I think we should do this and someone else thinks they should do that. And if it would turn out that I was more right than the mm -hmm. other people in terms of, I was right about 70% of the time, and they were generally right about 49, which is the case with most investors. And when it would work out my way, I would just say, you don't even call me godfather. <laughs> so I think the media thought that was, uh, you know, interesting or, or, or comical or whatever, and they, well, you, they, they hijacked Even though you that, haven't it, seen the whole movie, that's exactly what, yeah. you were using it correctly. Well, they, they, they hide, the, the press hijacks things into directions where they want to go. Um, the, the, the thing that's the most troublesome about the press is when, it's, when they're, they're almost, I would call it retweeting almost, they're re-reporting. Mm -hmm. So one reporter says something that's quasi true, yep. and then somebody else hijacks it and makes it in a completely different context which can actually make it literally the opposite of the truth, but suddenly it gets a life of its own, and then it can go on that way. And, and this is why I, I really don't like doing any more print interviews, mm. because I can't control the content. I'm much more comfortable talking to you on camera, sure. because at least you're not putting words in my mouth. You, you, can, you can try to twist things around if you want to try, but it's much more difficult. 
then if you're reporting, I mean, I, I had a, a run-in with a major news outlet. I won't mention names, but I was at an airport. I'm reading this article, and they had slipped my name into it in a way that was completely a non sequitur. And it, basically, what, at that, by that time, I was, if, if you did an article on me, you got eyeballs. Mm -hmm. you, 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 were, you got top go, you got most read on Bloomberg and all that. So the reporters would just put my name in things, and they'd try to somehow get into the headline because people do alerts and they yep. want to read the sure. story. So they got my name in this headline, and I call up the reporter, and I'm like, I have nothing to do with this story. And he, and he says, um, well, I'm not going to change it. So I ended up talking to the senior editor. And I said, this story, has I have no place in the story. And that's bad enough. But how you're using my name in the story is actually completely flipped the context. And the meaning that you're giving in the context of this article is completely misleading. And he goes, of course it is. We're intentionally misleading. Oh, God. That's what he said to me. And we wonder why nobody trusts the media. He said, we're intentionally misleading. And I just said, well, I can't. Uh, so I'd, I'd never spoke with that news organization again. What would you say to, um, to somebody who encounters adversity in the workplace? They're young in their careers. What's, what, what were some things that guided you outside of being inserted into a situation where you could really shine? which yeah. is great, um, but what, what kind of guidance would you give people coming into the workplace today, which can be a hostile place? What I did, I would not recommend to people, and that is I didn't take very much risk with my career, and I think that young people should take a lot of risk. I'm talking like in their 20s. Okay. And I was just focused on this place where I was. And one of my um, personality traits, which pr probably is a double-edged sword, is that I can be sort of an optimizer. So I'm in a situation, and I optimize it, but I don't, I don't look for other doors. Right. I'm, I'm interested in optimizing where I am. And I, I think that I should have started my own company in 1992, 1993 at the latest. And I, I, instead, I just was one more day, one more day, one more day until 2009, so many years later. Because, you know, so just, don't get, just, just don't plan. Don't get comfortable. Know. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would encourage people to be more planners and more uh, proactive than most people are comfortable being. But when I started Double Eye and I had uh, some young people that joined up that had been working with me prior, and there was one, um, and I said, you know, I wasn't paying people anything until mm -hmm. I realized, was told that that was against the law, that California have to pay people some minimum amount. Um, I, we actually, we were actually, weren't even really a company yet. We were just a, a, a SWAT team trying to work together. Yeah. And there was one person who was 23, and I said, "How can? Aren't you afraid coming here? I mean, you're not making any money." And and she said to me, "Jeffrey, I'm too young to be afraid." <laughs> Gosh, to go back there. <laughs> but when I was 23, I think she was 23. When I was 23, that's when I was. I wasn't in any kind of a situation optimized, but I certainly wasn't afraid. I got into a car, and drove across the country right. without any idea of what was going to be there. Uh, when I crossed the California state line. Is the idea of failure cliche? Are you a, are you a turn the cheek or an eye for an eye kind of a person? I am best defined by my uh, astrological profile. Where really? I'm massively Scorpio. If I, if I've actually gone, I used to date a girl whose father was a professional astrologer. And it's remarkable how- hey, You don't hear this every day. It's remarkable how this guy was helping people with astrology. It's pr it was pretty remarkable. So he did mine. And he's like old school. He didn't have a computer. He was charted out by hand. This, and this goes back. This goes way back. I mean, this is back in, in the, in the well, around 1980. And every astrologer has always said the same thing. They look at my chart and they go, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, you've got this 
the Sun and Mars, which is which governs Scorpio yep. and Venus, and they're all on top of each other. You're just unbelievably Scorpio, and they're right because you can kick me around a lot, and I'll tolerate it up to a point. Mm -hmm. And then once you really step on me, you're dead. So that's how I am. I roll with the punches pretty well. So I'll be turn the other cheek for a while, as long as it's, you know, just kind of nuisance stuff. Right. But then when you really, really kind of get to me, uh, people really just kind of get dead to me at that point. Surround yourself with Virgos. <laughs> I've I dated a number of Virgos. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's shift gears. Um, because financial literacy is a big problem. It sure is. In this country. Um, it, actually, financial illiteracy is what's taught. Illiteracy That's is, what's taught. Is if, if that's possible, it's possible to teach illiteracy. I mean, you start out illiterate, you have to be taught to read, and right. you become literate. But I actually think m most of what's taken for granted is actually taught illiteracy. My best example of that is when the consumer spending data comes out every month. You know, there's always a big cheer if there's a lot of spending. Uh -huh. And there's an extra loud cheer if that spending is based upon a huge increase in debt. Oh, because yes. Because what they say is, oh, this is a wonderful sign because it shows that that consumer confident. is confident, yes, confident in the future. And so a, a huge a pile of debt gets twisted into a positive thing. And Remember, I used to work inside the Fed. Yeah, so. you hear this all the time. <laughs> so. I mean, that, that, that you know, like, like, like home ownership is certainly preached, but most people never own their home. Well, that's they, the thing. Just, it's just, not home ownership. It's they're just renting, they're renting for another 30-year lease. Right. Because even now we have huge refinancing that's going on. Oh yeah. Um, we're actually back to almost 2003 levels for mm -hmm. some of the cohorts that were recently, yep. recently written. And these people may have been, I mean, most of these people are probably only a few years in, but they're people that are 10 years into their mortgage, and then they re-up for another, an, another 30 years. Another 30 year years. You know, there's, just... I, I think I, I think I heard that some almost impossible sounding fraction of retirees actually have mortgages. Oh gosh, yes. Which just shows you how ingrained Oh, I want to say it's close to 20%. Is. It's incredible. Uh, how is that possible? That's, that's, <laughs> that's servitude. That's not retirement. No, no. So there's a lot of financial illiteracy, a lot, and, and it, it keeps getting pushed. I mean, there's a, new, there's a new class in financial literacy that was just rolled out, I think, this year. It's ever smaller participation vehicles into the stock market. There's this thing called slices now. Oh, yeah. Where yes. you can actually buy $5 of a stock. Right. And then I think there's an advertisement on some of the financial media where they say you can be diversified with 10 slices for only $50. And, and I think first we had the, the, the futures contracts, then there were the mini futures contracts, mm -hmm. and then there's the, the mini, mini contracts to allow f a, a broader base of participation from less and less sophisticated people. Well, but I mean, are they learning anything? They're going to learn. They're, they're learning how, they're gonna learn through the school of hard knocks. Right. Um, what, what, what's going on, um, at the top of the stock market here in the United States in February, around February 19th or so, there was a record of call buying by the little investor for these little mini calls that you can buy now. Mm -hmm. There were seven, uh, seven odd million contracts on these, and that was shattered any record. But um, presently, uh, at least a couple of weeks ago, that record was sh totally taken out, yep. and there were more than 12 million. It was not, not a little bit taken out that record, it was shattered. Oh, Robin Hood. So what they're learning, th they think they're learning that you buy the Nifty 50 and Xerox takes you to 153, mm -hmm. but when it goes back down below 40, that's when they're really gonna learn. Oh yeah. And this is, this is the Nifty I, I was 50. reading a story on the wires that the, 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 the guy who runs Robin Hood had to get bulletproof glass. Yeah. Because yeah. Well, it, investors who had lost money were. These people don't even understand that when you, that, that you can lose more than all your money on some of these options trades. That's right. So they, they, you know, they could open, there's, a, there's an anecdote, I, I don't know if it's an urban legend or not, that somebody opened up their statement 
and it said negative seven hundred thirty thousand dollars. Oh, it's not an anecdote. It's yeah. it's a real kid. And apparently he threw himself in front of a train. Yeah. But I heard subsequent to the, to uh, hearing that story that that actually he misread it. And oh he didn't. gosh. And so it's doubly tragic that but but that can happen. Well, but look, I, I've got school aged kids. They've never come home and said, "Mom, I'm going to plot a stock and watch yeah. it for." A week or whatever. It's, it's yeah. it, the basic foundation's just not there. Well, the, 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 it, it's it's uh, that's correct. But the problem's much deeper than that. the The problem is that people don't understand the concept of saving money mm -hmm. before you buy something. I've, that's right. I've mm -hmm. talked about this in my webcast. There's a incredibly funny, but just a, a golden nugget of a clip from Saturday Night Live from years ago. So when Steve Martin was on the show. Oh gosh. And it's absolutely perfect. Uh, it's this couple is in the kitchen, Steve Martin and I can't remember Jane something or I think her name was the, uh, and and they're in the kitchen table fretting over their credit card bills, and what are we going to do? We're all this debt, and all of a sudden this this guy shows up, like off comes on camera, and he goes, "Read my book," and he, so, and he goes, "It's it's it's called." Don't buy stuff you can't afford. <laughs> and and he, they're like, what? I don't understand. What's, what does that mean? And, and, and he goes, well, look at page one. Don't, save money before you buy something. Go, save money? Yep. And he goes, like, well, wait a minute. If I don't have the money but I want something, I can buy it, right? And he goes, no, you can't buy it. Really? Yep. And then he says, but where are you supposed to get all of this saved money? Yep. <laughs> it's absolutely classic sketch. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget sketch. what my, 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 my current doctor and favorite medical doctor once said, Danielle, don't look at diets. If you want to lose weight, eat less. <laughs> He's like, it's, eat less and exercise more. It's yeah. pretty simple. Yeah. And it's the same concept. You know, I was at, we, we were really, at a point, at one point when I was a kid, where we were really scratching to get by. And we were at the supermarket, and we didn't have enough money. And we had to put stuff back. Yeah. And I said to my mother, because this was, there were no credit cards before 1970. That's so, right. So here, here we are, it's, credit cards had just kind of come, come around. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't you just put it on the credit card? And she just looked at me and she says, let me tell you something. Never, ever, ever yep. put food on a credit card, yep. ever. Never borrow money to buy food because that's a slippery slope which ends potentially very badly. I never forgot that. But also when I was a kid, there were no auto loans. Nope. They didn't exist. You had to save the money and go and actually buy the car. And now you can take seven years. No. Well, it's, it's, it's come this far. It's because, you know, it's one of these things where Everyone knows that borrowing money to buy food and leveraging up on your car and, you know, um, on that note, it's, it's funny. I was listening to the radio a while ago and they were talking about how there was a, such a steep decline in the prices of used luxury cars. And I mean luxury cars, Lambos, Ferraris. Right. And they were down like 50% in a year. And this was before COVID. This was when the economy was good, right? Right, right. And they said, you know, the prices have gone from like, I, I'm just making up numbers, but 300000 to $150,000. And I was like, how could that be? I mean, the, there's, the economy's okay. Yeah. And the reason was that they had toughened up on the lending standards oh, for used car loans. I was like, people are borrowing yep. three hundred grand to buy a Lambo? Oh, yeah. Their so, payments are like mortgage payments. So it's one of these things where everyone knows that th this is a bad way to go, but it's one of those things where in the short term, there's yep. a payoff, and it's just like our national debt, it's just like so many things that, yeah, yeah, you've been saying that this, this is a problem for years, and look, everything's fine. Yes, it's a problem in the long term, everybody says, but you know, that could be a long, long way away. But the, the, what happens is you glue enough short terms together and all of a sudden the yep. long term is today. So, and we're getting closer. I, we may not be there yet, but boy, we've, we've taken a mighty leap forward this year in terms of uh, heading towards you know, the debt cliff.
do you think that there's, because I'm seeing it, I'm hearing it, I'm seeing anecdotes of people who are saying, I've learned to live with less. Sure. I don't know what I was thinking. Sure. Do, do you think that... Um, I think that's permanent. Do you think that COVID has the potential to make saving great again? Yes, I, th I think at least on the margin. I think... I mean, guess what, 38% of families with the $100,000 of income didn't have a penny of savings coming into this. Right, and when they were staring into, into the abyss of no savings and potential job loss with, without perhaps a safety net from the government. And they made too much to get stimulus checks. They must have been really having a hard time because that's a, that must be a really scary thing. Um, and I think that could be a lasting lesson but mm -hmm. I, think, I think there's more doses of this lesson to come. I, I think that there's going to be a lot of people who are going to have to learn to live with less. They've already been sh sh got the fear of God put into them that they were staring into the abyss a few months right. ago. But what about... You need to what, save what about, for a rainy day and what, all of a sudden it's about the raining. What about the deflation that would be caused by a third of the labor force working from home. I, I think I saw something that a third of people want to work from home all the time. Yep. Well, if they live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, why don't they just move to, you know, some town in Texas or something? And it's, there's no taxes, it's certainly cheaper real estate, and obviously I'm gonna pay that person less. Mm -hmm. So that puts deflationary pressure on all related people in that whatever position that is, oh, they're that, looking that. For, for work. And the government seems reticent to give money to people that are more than double the median household income. And those are people that probably could lose their jobs or get downsized oh, yeah. to a, a, a lower wage simply because there could be pressure uh, for those positions. I, I think that well, companies are in a cost-cutting mode right now. I they're mean, in a cost-cutting no, mode. There's and no doubt about it. And the COVID thing has provided, the work-from-home experience has provided, I believe, I know it has for me, insight into sort of the performance that is being delivered by yep. individual employees. We've spoken about At that. Every company yep. I know, I, I have almost 300 employees. We, we do our best to be better than average, but of course not everybody can be better than average by definition. You know, and, and so I think we've got less fat than most places, mm -hmm. but there's got to be a lot of organizations that have a lot of fat in it. And that, that fat is being revealed. It I certainly mean, Jack is. Jack Welch, when he ran GE, used to lay off something like 10% as a policy. A policy of laying off 10% every year right. just because you want to keep people motivated, you want to keep them, yeah. you know, it's sort of a stick, you, you know, give them a carrot on the, on the bonus and a stick on the, on the fear. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of shows you that he believes that 10% is fat yeah. every year. And so I think there's insight that's being provided. And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot less demand for commercial real estate. Oh, gosh. Um, that's, I mean, if you think about central business district, cities in America that rely on public transportation and how much office property is in kind of the top 10 markets, again, that rely on public transportation. I, and there's just enormous amounts of, and, and this, is, this is the one asset class nobody really talks about, but it is levered up to the hilt. Yes, it is. Yeah, I mean, the whole commercial building thing was just, was, it was in plain sight for the last few years, just staring you in the face. I mean, I just can't get over how many hotels have been built. Oh, gosh. I just can't get over it. 50% it, of them are full service. Who's going to occupy these hotels? But, Everywhere. I mean, I grew up, we talked about Buffalo, New York. In, in the 90s, there were no hotels to speak of in downtown Buffalo. There was, I had to go there on business. I had to stay at like a Sheraton downtown. It was like a, yeah. a war zone. It was terrible. You drive down that same street today, there's a hotel like every block. They're everywhere. Every, and, and, every, and like, every small city since, in America has been gentrified. And since when? It, since, I mean, Buffalo's actually a, a great destination, particularly in the summertime. It's one of the best places in America. But most people don't think, unless they are informed about this through, through, through a referral, they don't think, I got to go to Buffalo this year, right? Yeah. Uh, even though it's super nice this time of year. But these hotels, they're, they're up and operating, and they're still building more. That's how private equity works. Yes. On volume. Yes. And you have 
the higher the risk of these of these uh, projects, you get a little extra yield, mm -hmm. and the Fed has been more than helpful in getting people to hold their nose and divert their eyes from the risk and look at that extra yield. I mean, there was a there there, there was an interesting uh, situation that's going on now because after when the COVID hit, there were all kinds of liquidations in credit, corporate mm -hmm. credit, junk bonds everywhere. It, it was much worse market than than the worst day of the global financial crisis yeah. in in March and April. There were literally times when there was no bid. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it lasted. Now until there was one night when there was no bid for treasuries in the middle of the night in Asia. That's right. And then the, the Fed finally showed up. After the Fed showed up, money started pouring into junk bonds oh, yeah. and uh, corporate investment grade, not so much loans, but certainly in, the, in the, the regular bonds, started pouring in. And that ended up dragging a lot of other things slowly higher yep. as well, asset-backed securities, mortgage-related things, commercial mortgages. Leverage loans have even and started suddenly, to kind of suddenly tick back. in the last few weeks, there's kind of a dearth of supply in those areas. And people are doing stranger and stranger things in order, it's just the opposite of March where they had to unload everything. Now they're trying to find things that have a little bit of extra yield on them. Now that the Fed has the 10 year treasury down at 60 basis points and the, the long bond at 1.3 and right. T bills at zero. So today, this very day, there was an issue uh, rolled out by Amazon warehouse. Okay. Now, Amazon is obviously uh, a, a, a good company. This bond is a six-year bond. It's rated as single A. And they talked it at a yield of 3%. Gosh. Okay, 3%. And that was deemed to be so attractive that the offering had 10 times the subscriptions as the amount that was going to be floated. It's coming next week. So what that means is that the yield is going to be significantly less than three because they're just going to keep lowering the yield sure. until nine out of the 10 people or nearly that drop out. It could easily end up being two and three quarters. So we're going to and grow I know Amazon is, is a better credit, but it's only single A rated. And but industrial is the one place yeah. that they've decided is going to be the, the, the chosen asset class and it's not going to, it's going to be the part of the commercial mortgage backed space. It's yeah. not going to get hurt and the whole thing. I mean, that, but, but back up for a minute because you, you know, you're talking about a mania in junk bond issuance. What June was the largest month on record. Yeah, but I, it, I, it, it was all, also corporate, corporate bonds broadly have broken all records. But it was also the highest month since 2009 for bankruptcies. What yes. the hell is going on? There's a uh, viewpoint that troubled areas, and it's not it's not articulated this way, but this is the way I think about it. Troubled areas, partially due to the Fed's policies, have been allowed to get so large that there's a perception, probably a misperception at the end of the day, that the prospect of them en masse going bad is so frightening mm -hmm. and so economically devastating that it won't be allowed to happen. That's, it's, it's really, it, the but airlines- But it's happening. The airlines did it's it It's very too. managed, it's very- But it is happening. We have like, yes. okay, so today you wake up and it's Brooks Brothers and tomorrow right. it's Sur La Table. It's going to, and, and it's going to continue. And, it's, and, and this, this, this thing about the, the, the airline bailout, you know, which you, you keep your employees for a few months. They've already been fired ahead of time. I know, I know, that's what I was getting to. And, and we've given them $58 billion when they used $45.5 billion to buy back their stock. So in essence, we bought back their stock at a 25% profit, except for one thing. We don't own the stock. Right. <laughs> they still own the stock. I mean, we, bought, yeah. we bought essentially their, their buybacks off their hands and we don't even own the stock. And what, but what's happening, right? So why did that happen? Well, we can't, we can't let all these people go. We can't let, lose all these jobs uh, during March and April. Well, you're gonna lose them anyway because they've already pre-announced the layoffs en masse at both United and American, and American. Airlines. And of course, of course, there's no way out for them. Uh, under a capitalist regime other than bankruptcy. That's the only way out. I mean, their, their debt is absurdly high. Oh, I'm mean, talking I'm, about I'm, just I'm, American I'm, Airlines to pick one. Uh, their debt is so high. And, and what we're doing- And they just raised $2 billion. What we're doing is giving them, is adding to, adding to their, their grotesque debt burden relative to their equity. So it's obviously, again, it's not a solution. It's just a short, it's again, short-term versus long-term.
But you know what you know what, what we're seeing though is companies filing and this this was the the holder of Ann Taylor and Lane Bryant brands. So we're going to file. Yeah. There's 3,000 stores involved. We're going to liquidate 1,200 on day one. That's not the way you normally see Chapter 11, but there's so much debt out there sure. that there's so much little left when you well, do what about file. I, I what think, are you going to get the creditors? I think the one that the history books will really reference is the Hertz equity offering. Oh, gosh. A, a, a Chapter 11 company that's issuing equity? Yeah. Uh, how is that possible? Well, it turned out it wasn't possible. Okay, so <laughs> they, they so, couldn't get it done. So you're getting you're getting to the crux of the matter. Has the Fed permanently changed the rules of engagement? Will fundamentals have they negated the ability for markets to signal distress? Has 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 the Fed won? In in parts of the market, they they have won for now anyway. In part, in other parts of the market, um, they they have been appropriately absent. So we can talk about junk bonds, mm -hmm. where um, the prices have been clearly propped up. The Fed really went all in April 9th. I think they announced corporate bond buying March 23rd, yep. but it was really April 9th that changed the game. And that's when the ETFs that own corporate bonds went up like five, eight points in a yep. minute. And so if you analyze a basket of junk bonds, I can't call them high yield because the yield isn't high, so we have to call them junk bonds. The um, the price that the Fed is, in essence, paying for them is clearly not a market signal. It's clearly a targeted price right. by the Fed, and it's probably higher than what you're going to get after you work through the bankruptcies mm -hmm. on a basket of high-yield bonds. So, that, so in, that, in that sense, the, the Fed has won in terms of eliminating volatility in the corporate bond market, but they haven't really won in terms of investors getting all their money back. because. It's one thing to have a price set every day. It's another thing to have a recovery right. that comes out. Now, in other parts of the market, we mentioned uh, you know, s excesses in commercial lending. The commercial mortgage-backed securities market, down in the capital structure, so the way it works is you don't just buy a, a, a loan to a building. That loan then gets risk tranched, if you will. Right. They're so like the, sub, the subprime somebody's holding, loans of yesterday. Somebody's holding this, the bag right. down here, and they're probably wiped out. I think everyone knows that at this point on certain parts of that market. And as you move up, you get to double B ratings, which is a high junk bond rating, a triple B rating, which is a, uh, the lowest uh, notch of investment grade. Right. Those areas have barely rallied since the, the, the awareness of you know, rent forgiveness and mm -hmm. the depths of the potential problems. Um, so I think that you're actually getting a signal there. I actually think that, that part of the market is really dicey. Oh gosh. It's really risky. So this is not something that you want to do, uh, do at home. But this reminds me of what happened in the mortgage market for residential loans back in 2008, yep. where it turned out that the market was so overwhelmed that prices got pushed down so far that actually a professional, which I like to think that, <laughs> that I am, um, in that sector actually has opportunity. It's mm -hmm. just that you have to have a risk, pro risk profile that yep. can take it. Right. Because many of these assets, they were sold, uh, new issue at, 90, at a dollar price of 95 or mm -hmm. something. They went down to no bid, literally, uh, but maybe 40. M maybe they're 50 today. Yep. They haven't rallied up that much because the market is trying to just parse out it, it can't, where, where yeah. that cliff is. And you have to do it, if you're a prudent person, you have to look at that without the most optimistic case is your base case. Right. You've got to have a... Well, you've, you've got, what, a 25% delinquency rate in hotels alone. Yeah. I mean, yeah. How, do you, how do you price that risk unless you are a professional? Right, and, and, and you have to... And what's interesting about that is thanks to the Fed coming in and putting their kind of holy water on parts of the market, like AAA CMBS is doing great. Mm -hmm. the long cash flow AAA CMBS sold today at a yield of um, 99 over the 30 year, so it was 2.29%. That's because it's got the halo effect right. overneath it. But as you go down the capital structure, you actually get real prices. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to high risk investors and I say, this is something you might want to look at, they go, oh no, no way. I mean, uh, you know, 
cruise lines, hospitality, hotels. And I go, look, that's actually where you're getting real prices. Somebody's going to buy it. You, that's where the real prices are. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to make money, right. but you could make an awful lot of money under a certain outcome. So you might have a good risk, risk reward profile. But yeah, so the Fed, the, the Fed has um, certainly gone where they've never gone before. Mm -hmm. And that is interesting to me because I'm sure you're aware that the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 does not allow the buying of corporate bonds. No. And we have not amended that. And yet we're, so we're in direct violation right now. Well, I think the Treasury Department has done a leveraged buyout of the Fed using Enron accounting. That's Something how like, I like to. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's colorful, but I, I think that's. Off balance sheet. I think, I think it's kind of on target. Well, it's kind of illegal. But. Yes, but what it, that tells me is when somebody is now doing things outside their charter, it means that they might do it again. You know, it's, it's like one of those things. I mean, if, if, well, if, you, if, if, you if somebody at, if you cheats the, on their spouse, you know, yeah. it's sort of like, gee, maybe they will again. I mean, right? If, I mean, if, if you look at the fine print, they're set up to buy equities at BlackRock. They yes. just haven't announced the structure yet. They're awfully but, close, aren't they? But it's, well, all you need is a few down days, and well, then I'm, they'll, I'm, they'll cross that last Rubicon. There's actually one more Rubicon beyond buying stocks that worries me the most. That's declaring that their liabilities are legal tender and not being a, a lender through, the, of this, through this, you know, facilitating this LBO, as you call it, but actually saying, we're just now allocating money. That's the true money printing. And the true money printing has a perfect record historically of failing. And you can go to Rome, you can go to France in the late 18th century, you can go to the Weimar Republic. It's all the same. You go off of any real money, you go into a money printing scheme, and what happens has been universally correct through human history that I can identify. That is, what, the people that were poor starve to death. The people that were middle class turn into what the poor used to be. And the people who are in the center of the money printing mechanism get ridiculously wealthy because they make sure that the money trucks make extra deliveries to their house. And this ends up enraging the starving people and the people that used to that have had a big haircut to their standard of living. And so they do things like march from Paris to Versailles in the pouring rain barefoot in, in numbers of the thousands, if not tens of thousands, to try to well, they ended up taking uh, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette back to Paris. They didn't kill them right away, but they, they made them prisoners. And that's so, what ends up happening. But we're not, I mean, far be it for me to say, but I mean, watch the news. We're not that far. We're getting closer. Well, talk every to me. Day. Talk to me about inequality because up until recently, it was kind of seen as this area of philosophy. It was just kind of something to bandy about and talk about as if, as if it was abstract in nature. You know, I think it's pretty real. It's, it's very real. When you see that Bezos is pushing 200 billion, you know, um, in, in, in personal wealth. And I think what's, what's unfortunate about the inequality situation is that there is truth, partial truth, to the idea that these people that are on the you know, the, 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 the winning end of the inequality, a lot of them don't pay hardly any taxes at all. And there is partial truth in that. Unfortunately, that partial truth has most Americans, even those that are upper middle class, believing that nobody that has created wealth for themselves has really paid any taxes. It's completely untrue. I had a massive tax increase from the Trump tax plan. My ta I had a huge tax increase mm -hmm. because I lost my deductibility right. for my state income tax, and I'm paying 13.3 mm -hmm. to Sacramento on virtually all of my money. So I actually pay a huge tax rate. And, and yet, yet the perception and is... Yet the perce I actually say this to people, and they say, you don't even pay 20%. And I say, you, how, how can you dictate to me what... what I'm paying in taxes. I know exactly what I'm paying in taxes, right. and it's over 50 percent between state, and this is just income tax, between right. state and federal. So the fact that Mitt Romney paid 14 percent in the year that he used when he was running for president, 
that unfortunately Stuck. sells the partial truth as a universal truth. You know, that he's doing, he's pay, paying a ridiculously low tax rate versus somebody that's making a fraction of what he's making. And that, it leads to the fact that that partial truth exists, and it exists particularly for those that are mega, mega, mega on the side of winning in the inequality, right. it gets people angry. Well, what, what's the better way? What, where, it, I mean, where, where, where do we start as a country? <laughs> I mean, I, it's a really small question, I, I know. <laughs> Uh, but I mean, but but is it education reform? Is it? Is I it think I think education reform is a glaring topic that begs to be addressed mm -hmm. because you know when the civil rights movement was really happening in the 1950s, and you had Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, yep. and it was about striking down the the separate but equal Plessy versus Ferguson ruling from decades before. You know, the people in the South didn't want to get rid of the segregation, I think, largely speaking, at least the politicians that were in charge. But they made an argument that carried a lot of water. And it was, aren't your schools really segregated up in Boston, too? Mm -hmm. Aren't they really? Oh, yeah. I mean, aren't they really segregated in New York City today? Aren't mm -hmm. they really in Los Angeles yep. today? Aren't they really segregated? It's not by, exactly by, by skin color so much. But de facto, there's a lot of that in there. And it has a lot to do with opportunity that needs, we, we need to uh, introduce opportunity again. Because what we've done, we, we, when, when the topic of universal basic income mm -hmm. started to come up with Andrew Yang and the like, a lot of people thought this is a cockamamie idea. We've been doing a version of universal basic income since the 60s. It's called welfare. Right. All right. Now, Welfare was, a, you could sell it as being uh, caring, but you could also sell it as being very uncaring because you're basically making a bargain with a certain segment of the population. We'll give you a subsistence type of lifestyle, right. and in exchange, you and your kids and your grandkids will never have any real opportunity. Right. There's never going to be a way out. It, it's a devil, it's a, it's a bargain with the devil. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, um, that kind of was, I mean, Lyndon Johnson knew that when he went gung-ho into it. He knew, I think he made the statement that thanks to the, the programs, the Great Society programs, that certain segments of the population would be democratic for decades to come. Yep. And he was absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's interesting, Kanye West is provocative and he's acting like he might be running for president, which is pretty interesting because if he actually ran for president, I think he would take Biden's chances away. I think they would be gone. Kanye West so is Ross Perot. It's Ross the strangest Perot. thing because it's sort of like, in a weird sense, the, 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 the African American community is in charge of our elections. They're in charge of it because for reasons that might be good or might just be historical, their votes go overwhelmingly to the Democratic candidate right. every, every single time. If they just split their vote 50-50, mm -hmm. there would be much more of a dialogue that was going on. Right. But instead, they're just taken for granted. And so in a weird sense, black community has much more political power than they think if they will just seize it. And Conway West has sort of kind of shown the light, I think, that way, because if he actually, one man, one black man said, I'm going to run for president, I think he controls the election. Mm -hmm. So Conway West sure isn't disenfranchised. He's mm -hmm. probably the most politically powerful person in this moment that we're experiencing right now. Well, talk to me about this moment because I, I think I speak for a lot of Americans who don't feel like they have a choice on November the 3rd, who, who they don't feel, and, and they felt this way for a generation. This is not about one man or the other. It's not that. But well, it's because you had, you, you, you had the Republicrats basically take power, where you went from you know, Bush to Clinton to Bush to Obama. It's all the same thing. 
Nothing happened. You, you, also so, had, you also had Democrats move over to the side of corporate America at the same time. Sure. So that's you had you, you had you had mixture on both sides, but that, at that's, some point, that, that's, what, what, I'm, I'm talking right, about middle-income workers in America, right, who, they people under, who are working, making $120,000 and branded right, as the, wealthy. The Republican leaders don't care about the, the middle-class voice at all. That's no. what Trump tapped into. He's kind of a Republican himself. So, but he was enough of a differentiated product, particularly because he was running against, you know, the, the, the dynasty, right. literally. Um, he was such a differentiated product, they managed to get him, get him over the hump. But there really is no difference there. And I think what happened is with the Republican entity coming into existence, suddenly every politician in the so-called Democratic and Republican Party pretty much were influence peddlers. It used to be the Republicans were influence peddlers and the Democrats were trying to stand up for the smaller voice, but that got thrown by the wayside. And I don't think people identify that with laser precision, but they feel it. They feel right. that something's wrong. I heard this analogy I thought was perfect. I think it was Joe Rogan, which I've listened to only one of his podcasts, but it was on this podcast. And he said, it's sort of like your immune system you know, you're like white blood cells are all gathering somewhere. They're not sure what's wrong. Right. But they, know, they just know that something's wrong. They can sense it. And that, that's, that's where we are. And Can we have a third party? Absolutely. We can Do you believe party. in long cycles? I believe that if the election were 2021 instead of 2020, there would be three parties. I just don't think there's enough time. Right. And Kanye could probably try to pull it off, but... Uh, you, 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 it's just so hard to register in all these states and all, mm -hmm, and all of these mm -hmm. things. But when I look at labor force participation, which fell during the global financial crisis and then rebounded somewhat in recent years, thanks to COVID, it got down to 52%. Right. If that goes below 50, you got yourself a third party. True. You got yourself a winning third party because you call it the locked out party the unemployment well, party, look, the left behind party. We're watching the layoffs climb up the income ladder. It's gonna continue. We're witnessing that right it's now. Going to get, I think it's gonna get a lot worse. And I think, I think that's going to put a real new kind of fear into what I call middle management type of people. They might realize that you know, what they've worked towards, the skill set that they've developed may not be in demand. I remember when I was years ago, it was in 1992, Two. I was doing a road show for a closed-end fund we were doing. And it was such retail uh, politics. We were driving around in rented white Tauruses. For some reason, they were always a white Taurus. <laughs> and I was driving around with a Dean Witter wholesaler. Oh, gosh. And we would drive from small-ish city to small-ish city mm -hmm. and pull into the Dean Witter retail office. and there'd Branch. Be a branch. And there'd be a team of about 20 people there, and we always went and bought them donuts, because that's how they, you would get them to come to the meeting by buying them donuts. And I would give them our pitch. And then we would fold up the little easel thing, put it in the trunk of the white Taurus, and drive two hours to the next meeting. We'd do like six of these a day, you know, every day of the week. And you'd, one of those things where you wake up and you have that horrifying feeling, which I think I only had on these road trips, where you actually wake up and you go, I don't know what city I'm in. Oh gosh. I don't know where I am. I'm in some, another, another Marriott, you know, they all look the same. Oh yeah. So anyway, as you're driving those two miles, you know, you gotta have something to talk about. So this Dean Witter guy was saying, you know, you gotta understand things can change really profoundly almost overnight. He said, I ha had this great gig. I was selling limited partnerships at like, like Payphone leases, the biggest ripoff products ever. They had a 20% load. And, they, and these Gosh. guys were jamming them to retail investors. Yeah, yeah. And he said, I was literally got up one morning, I turned on the radio, and the news, I heard the news, and I looked in the mirror, and I was out of business. He was legislated out of business by the stroke of a pen. Yep. And he said, it was just so life changing because. It was just another day. It was just another, he'd been doing this for years, and that, that was all just taken away from him. Well, that could happen to his people, not just who are baristas mm -hmm. or maids in hotels. This could happen to these middle management people.
who think that they're, you know, that they feel completely embedded, the, the system has been largely unchanged for their whole oh, career. Confidence in job security right now and prospects for jobs are in different zip codes. Right, very different zip codes. And they're sort of like, they start to realize this could start happening to me. And if it happens to the guy in the office next door, mm -hmm. or you know, the, the woman who they c c uh, carpool with or whatever, yeah. they start to go, wait a minute. Yeah. This might not be the level place to stand that I always thought it was. It's, it's, it's one thing to say that a retailer that you th thought was gonna go out of business, that that process was expedited. It's another thing to wake up and see that Wells Fargo is gonna lay off tens of thousands of people. It's just, they're, they're, they're different. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about uh, personal experience regarding that. We have a lot of wildfires in Southern California, mm -hmm. but most of them are out in the pills and so on. And I would hear, oh, there's wildfires. And I would just, I, it was always somebody else's problem. You know, I, I, I live near the ocean and, uh, you know, it's, it's just not typical. So one day in January of this year, late January, it's a Monday, and I get up and I always you know, check what's going on. And an evacuation map for Southern California. I'm like, oh, isn't that interesting? And I just keep looking at it. <laughs> and it took me like a minute and a half to finally accept the fact I'm in the evacuation zone. I'm on that map. Th this isn't some guy 75 miles away like it usually is. Mm -hmm. And I kept looking at it. No, I'm in the zone. Yep. And so I'm like, uh-oh. So we're like, let's get a U-Haul. And we spend like four hours putting stuff together, putting in the U-Haul, ready to go. It turned out that we were at the edge of the evacuation zone, and we were very close to being evacuated, we never were. But it's that sort of, that crack of doom thing where you think, this can't, ah, that's somebody else's problem. And I, I think there'll be growing experiences, an increase in the experiences of that type of crack of doom moment. So presumably there'll be band-aids along the way. There, there will be another iteration or had a couple two of, tourniquets, so. of stimulus, yeah. and we'll get something before the election. For sure. So let's weave in sovereignty. Do you see, I mean, I think the 30-year bond just had the most incredible auction ever. Yeah. Um, but look further down the path. Do you see the debt of the United States? I mean, they downgraded China, Fitch down, uh, excuse me, Fitch down, downgraded Canada. I'm pointing north. Um, do you think we'll get downgraded? No. I don't think you can plausibly downgrade uh, a bond issuer who can pay in their own currency. Well, they did it in, what, August of 11? Yeah, that was a mistake. I, I, I think that they were overstepping their boundaries. I think the rating agencies are supposed to opine on the probability of you not getting your money back. I don't think they're supposed to opine on the purchasing power of the money you get back. And that's what they were in essence doing, I think. Okay. They were worried that the value of the dollar would be put in peril, but that's not their job. Their job is to say, are you gonna get your money back? And Warren Buffett was right on this. He said they should actually have upgraded it to quadruple A because you, will, you can absolutely print your way out of it. You can absolutely pay your, pay your debt back. Will it be worth anything? Well, I think there's two, there's two possibilities. That you cut the promises to pay which is very, very politically challenging. The United States now has about $154 trillion of unfunded promises to pay, seven and a half per times GDP. There's no way that you can pay that back and purchase Nobody power. talks about that, by the way. Well, if, one way to think about it is if you decide we're gonna fund these. And we know it's a long slog, so we're gonna do it over 75 years. You'd have to take 10% of your GDP in today's dollars mm -hmm. and put it aside. That would be a 75 year depression. Yeah. So it doesn't seem possible that you can pay it back with purchasing power. So you either have to default on them, which is possible. You can default on pieces of social security pretty easily, just raise the age. Just raise the age. Raise the age from present age to, let's go crazy and say 80. That solves it. it solves the problem. Yeah. Now, well there's, see, all that actuarial stuff yeah. is really handy. That's right, it solves the problem, but, but the problem is so solvable and yet you have to be 
it's like chemotherapy. I mean, you've got to you've, mm -hmm. you've be fearful of a worse outcome, and that hasn't happened yet. Uh, well, okay, so let, let's weave ever so briefly the small subjects of China and COVID into this discussion and reserve currency status. And our place on the global stage, their place on the global stage, 116 countries joined together with Australia to demand an independent inquiry into the source of the virus. So yeah. it, it's- That's theater. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not gonna make it go away. It doesn't change anything. But China has one really big advantage over a system like the United States has. Mm -hmm. And it's also a huge disadvantage, but everything's always a double-edged sword. There's no, and so their, their big advantage is they're an autocracy. That's a big disadvantage for human rights but it's a huge advantage for long-term planning mm -hmm. because you don't have to worry about somebody scuttling your plan mm -hmm. four years from now and starting another plan. So I, I had lunch with Henry Kissinger years ago and he loves to tell these stories of his rubbing elbows with the world, the world powers. And he told me that he had a, a dinner with the leader of China, and this was many years ago, and the leader was impressing upon him how they have a hundred year view. We have a hundred year view here in China, and it's fine with us if it takes a hundred years for us to officially have Taiwan back. We don't care one bit. And then Kissinger said that he subsequently had dinner with the same guy 30 years later, or, or maybe his successor at this time. And he said, you know, I was told 30 years ago that you can wait a hundred years for Taiwan. Is that still the case? Can you still wait a hundred years? And he said, well, that was 30 years ago, so we can wait 70 years. See? Right? But they have that plan. They have... I mean, they have is, the, is, they is have reserve savings. currency they status have, they, part they have, of it? They have gold. Of course they want reserve currency status. Of course. Is military in there somewhere? Of course. Um, yes. They're, they are obviously ascendant. They speak... I've, I haven't been to China in a long time. I went there from 2005 to 2009 every year. I can't tell you how much it changed over that short period of time. Mm -hmm. I went there and I met with like real senior people in finance, you know, Bank of China people, like head guys or deputy head guys. And the first time I went there, I got one type of reception. And it was, it was they were a little bit docile, I would say. And then 2009, the reception was confidence strength mm -hmm. they were they, they were sort of like well we'll see what happens we'll see what they they had a lot they had a lot of moxie that they didn't have in 2005 and they still this do. is this is 11 years later it's it's got to be 10x oh sure what it was in 2009 and american companies are discovering that even though they've that, that they've gotten a lot of lip service that that the door is only partially open and that they'll it's it well, just, I mean, and, and whatever, yeah. 11 years ago, that well, they, weren't, they weren't 17, American 18 percent of, of, of GDP. Uh, American Global consumers GDP. are waking up to the, to, the, to the reality that we've borrowed a ton of money to buy plastic trinkets from China mm -hmm. on vendor financing. Mm -hmm. And we've even gone so far, and people woke up with the COVID, they've gone so far as to have one source of certain essential things and that's China for supply chains right. and, and other things. 24% of U.S. auto supplies. How about pharmaceuticals? Come now that from we're China. talking about COVID. Gosh. Right? And so they're starting to realize that what was such a great deal with all of this cheap goods, where the debt that you were incurring to buy it was an abstraction, it was on the government's balance sheet, or, you know, and they're starting to realize that they're tied together. It's pretty real. And as they, the building blocks of knowledge are starting to fall into place much more than where you were four years ago on how the, how the, 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 how the system got to this place by short-term feel-good things mm -hmm. being the priority, but the land that it takes you to is one that must ultimately fail. So on that happy note, um, if you're Joe Q investor and you're being told that it's going to be a V-shaped recovery and that everything's going to be fine, um, 
I, that's, I, that's, I, I don't see how anyone can accept that I, I, well, as, 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 as a logical statement. Because, when when because does you this cannot, end? You cannot take 20% of the labor force and have them not produce anything. Mm -hmm. And there's no consequences. Nothing happens. Everyone's lifestyle is the same. Nothing changes. Mm -hmm. well, no, that, that's, that's not mathematically possible. So at some point, they'll pull the extra stimulus. They'll, they'll mortgage forbearance will go away. Rent moratoriums will disappear. Uh, eventually, they must. I, I think they're going to last a lot longer than they're letting mm -hmm. on because it's, it's kind of got the tiger by the tail. They don't want to let them go. There's no, there's no cap on the debt ceiling until June of 2021. Jay Powell says our ability to quantitative ease by bonds is infinite. Yep. That's a, that's a pretty bold statement. I mean, it was like in the days when there were actual live telephone solicitors and not robots, they would actually call up and you'd answer, back in the days when you would have a landline, this is years ago, this guy calls up and he's trying to hard sell me on something. He, he, was, he was a guy, he was an Indian accented guy. And I go, look, I have absolutely zero interest. There's no chance of me buying this thing. You're just completely wasting your time. And he goes, very strong opening position. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I almost wanted to buy the thing from the guy because that was, that was just a great that's brilliant. That was just a brilliant, right? But that's what Powell just did. I mean, very strong opening position. Right. An infinite. Well, there's no infinity. There is but no infinity. But he means that there's no ceiling. Right. So, so what's an investor to do to protect themselves? Is there any? I mean, it's, uh, there has to be an end game here. I'm sorry, but the, yeah, I, I I hate to give a, a financial media type answer, but but in this case, are I you going to say diversify, diversify, diversify? Yeah, yes, and I, I hate that answer because mm -hmm. that's that's an answer that people give to hold hold uh, their clients' hands through rough times. Right, right, right. But in this case, since there's such a binary outcome that there could be confiscation and there could be debasement, both. Mm -hmm. And it's really almost a policy choice, but it seems that one of those choices is going to have to start to be at least discussed seriously in polite company. And so you have to, I wouldn't say diversify, you have to barbell. Right. Barbell. So you have to own um, things that will survive debasement. Mm -hmm. And you, hard assets. Yeah, hard assets. And you have to own, the, the, the reason to own stocks would be that at least if we're going to add two zeros to the price of everything, you probably add two zeros to the price of stocks too. Right. So at least you're probably kind of floating along okay. The idea that you're going, I mean, I saw somebody. You um, don't mean that stocks are not going to correct. Uh, you can always manipulate them. The Fed has manipulated the corporate bond market. I, I think absent manipulation, the, the stock market would be uh, in serious trouble unless there was a, a, a true money printing exercise. I mean, the stock market has a PE that is at such nosebleed levels relative to sober earnings. And as we all know, all of the earnings growth the past five years is the super six. Yep. FANG, and Alphabet, and all that stuff, yep. Microsoft. Away from that, there isn't any earnings growth at all in the last mm -hmm. five years, which means that earnings are actually down if you hadn't had a tax cut. And if Joe Biden wins and he promises with glee, he promises to reverse Raise the tax taxes, cut, yeah. well, how's that gonna affect the, the PE of the stock market? Mm -hmm. it's, it's gonna make it not just 25 on forward earnings, and we're, we're getting within spitting distance of the OO highest ever forward PE. And you know, so that would be a really big problem, but it's, it's the most narrow market ever. And uh, so it, it, you know, should you own zero? No because it's one of those barbell weights. But I, I, think, um, I think hard assets, and that, that's not very good advice to John Q investor, because John Q investor doesn't have any savings. Right. And you know, these that's people- That's the thing, these hard, are, hard assets require liquidity to, right, to get these into. These people that are, that, are, that are buying $50 of slices, they're not gonna get rich on $50 of slices. No. They, they go up 10X, which, I, I saw a guy on a financial program very recently, it was actually June 8th, which was the, the top uh, so far of, of this uh, rally of the stock market. And um, it was June 8th. And there was actually a guy who said, I've been bearish. I've been wrong. I was too bearish, too conservative in April. And I've reevaluated. I think this is the best buying opportunity of my career. 
I just, I had to rewind it and watch it several times because I, I can't believe it. it, it, it really, at, at, at a PE of 25, this is a better buying opportunity than March of 09 when the PE was single digits, right? I mean, it, that kind of mentality is, they'll, they'll learn the hard way. Look, you, you've given me a lot more time than I was planning on, so this has been a real treat. I have one last really, really hard question for you. Okay. Are the Bills going to win the NF NFC East? They, they almost assuredly will if there's a season. <laughs> and that's what makes me so frustrated because we suffered through 17 years of no playoffs for the Bills. And then we kind of side-doored in through a miracle play by the Cincinnati Bengals. And we didn't really deserve to be there. But then we, we did deserve to be there last year. We actually mm -hmm. earned, earned it. And the Bills are clearly ascendant. And they actually look like one of the best teams in the NFL. And it, when, isn't that just the perfect torture for the long-suffering Bills fan that when you're just about to start on an upswing, they kneecap you and you know, pull the chair out from under the season, and there isn't one. But I, I think almost assuredly the Bills would win the AFC East uh, if, if there's a season. Well, um, I'll be cheering for them. I'm not a big Cowboys fan. So um, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. All right. Go Bills.